guys, and welcome to the Moms and Mysteries podcast, a true crime podcast featuring myself, Mandy, and my dear friend, Melissa. Hi, Melissa. Hi, Mandy. How are you? I'm great. It's Groundhog Day. I feel like every day lately has been kind, oh. of, <laughs> kind of the same. I just feel like that impending sense of first day of school doom. is on the way. It's right mm-hmm. around the corner. Yeah, we can call that doom. <laughs> <laughs> I think my kids are calling it doom. Neither one of them wanted to know like how many days were left. Like my son the whole summer is like, do not tell me how long it is. I'm like, do you want like a little a little warning right before or do you want me to tell you the day of? He's like, I already figured it out. It's only six days. I was like, all right, we're good. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, it, it's coming up fast. And we just started implementing, like we started kind of going back to like the old rules that we used to have right. about like when it's time to like shut down all the screens and mm-hmm. hand over the phones and get in bed and so that's been kind of an adjustment we kind of got a little bit lax over the summer um, oh yeah my kids definitely do more than two hours a day of screen time I, I am totally upfront. I laugh that. in the face of that number it's <laughs> yeah just, it's good for you if you can but that's never even been right. something I've attempted Right. Yeah. Um, So now we've been kind of my kids have been staying up really, really late, like every night, just playing games with each other and with their friends that are from school. And I'm like, don't aren't your friends from school? Like, aren't their parents starting to (laughs) maybe like want them to kind of get back into more of like a school schedule, more normal schedule? I think all the parents are waiting for each other, like when their kids start, then everybody (laughs) else's. So you need that one parent who's like, well, I'm that parent. Yeah. Oh, nice. I am not. (laughs) Yeah. So I mean, it's we're trying I've been Mm -hmm. trying to go around and collect the phones at a certain time every night and just like so everybody kind of like doesn't think about it and just goes to bed but it's been it's been hard because my kids have been used to been sleeping in Mm -hmm. until pretty late in the mornings now and so um yeah the first day and week of school I think is going to be very interesting remind me (laughs) do you guys start like in the middle of the week or is it the beginning of the week I think we start on like a Tuesday okay or a Wednesday. Uh, yeah, it's in the middle of the week. I don't really understand why they do that. I guess to make it easier for you. Yeah, I actually week. am starting to get on board with that idea because we start on Thursday and I'm like, oh, what a waste because my son only goes three days a week and Thursday is his last day of the week. So um, I was like, what a waste. But then I was like, no, actually, it's a great way to like dip yeah. your toes into it, fix all the things that went wrong the week before, right. <laughs> actually take the phones over the weekend. That will be me. And, uh, you know, really get it, get on board with it. But yeah, I'm excited. I'm anxious. I have a high schooler. You have um, almost a high schooler last year, middle school, right? Crazy. Oh my gosh. Yes, Mm -hmm. I know. And now they want to, um, we got like all these eighth grade, incoming eighth grader messages from the school Mm -hmm. and they want to have us set up a whole family meeting so we can all talk about, you know, my son's plans for high school and everything. I'm like, hold on, like this sounds very... Where's the adult setting this up? Could they come here and do that for me? That's how I feel. I'm always like, my daughter's like, I have to do volunteer stuff this year. I have to do this. I'm like, well, we're going to meet with the guidance counselor because I don't even know what you're talking about. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I can see why they want to do a family meeting because the incoming eighth graders and especially the ones going in, like you said, like your daughter's going into high school. It's a whole different ballgame. So I'm thankful that our school like wants to prepare them for that transition in their eighth grade year. So Mm -hmm. that's really nice. But yeah, it is wild to think. And then my little one's going into fifth grade. So Aww. yeah. My little it's one's going into fourth. Of, so we're like opposite. The end of an era. Yeah. I know. I can't believe he's going to be in. I know. I, okay. We won't talk about it. But yeah, I know. I <laughs> he's almost in middle school. <laughs> we're going through a lot here. We should have debriefed really before. Are. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> right? <laughs> one thing I'm not going through, though, Melissa, is selling my home, thankfully. Um, yeah. This week's episode kind news. of touches on, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, on selling your home. But that would also add... I feel like a fun element to back to school, wouldn't it? Fun? <laughs> <laughs> My face almost froze. No. <laughs> yeah. So I feel like selling your home is kind of a nightmare for most people at pretty much any time of the year. I can't think of one that's going to be a good one. Um, and Melissa, you know, your husband worked in real estate for a little while. Yep. So I'm sure you've heard it all. You've probably heard every possible story there is out there about people who want to buy or sell an entire house. Uh, But I bet none of them compare to the story that we have this week. Sometimes when a house is for sale, it also happens to be vacant, which is really great for the realtors who are tasked with showing the home to potential buyers because course they don't have to worry about the homeowner's schedule but many times a house that's up for sale is actually still occupied by the owner who's trying to sell it and they have to endure this process of having multiple strangers paraded around their homes while they kind of cross their fingers that somebody is like yes I want to buy this so for me 
Absolutely. Immediately, no. (laughs) Of anyone in my life that I know, you would be the most against somebody walking around your house with you not there. You'd be like, absolutely not. Yeah, there's no way I could ever do that. Um, I'm not really somebody who like loves having a ton of company even coming to my house, much less people I don't know coming and looking around. While my things are still in there, I know whenever people are moving, they do kind of, they stage the home so like they don't have like all their regular things necessarily sitting out, but I feel like they still have a lot of their stuff. It's only whatever you can chunk into the closet right before they call you to say we have somebody coming (laughs) in an hour. It's just throwing things in a closet and hoping nobody opens it. Yeah. Well, and if you're going to buy the house, you're probably going to want to look in the closet. So I don't know how good an idea (laughs) that is. (laughs) So I definitely feel like that kind of whole scene just gives me anxiety. And it never really crossed my mind, though, that something truly awful could happen during a house showing, even a murder. The idea that somebody else would be murdered in my home while I wasn't there, while it was being shown by a realtor, never crossed my mind until this week. Congratulations, everyone. Now it's in your mind as well. (laughs) Happy selling. (laughs) So it was January 4th, 2001, when a homeowner that we'll call Gina arrived at home on her lunch break and made a horrific discovery. Gina went inside the garage, but was surprised to see that her front door was actually slightly open, and she noticed the sound of running water coming from upstairs. So as we said, Gina had her home listed for sale, and so she knew that there were realtors and potential buyers coming in and out to look at it. So the fact that there were signs that somebody had been there maybe would not have been super alarming on its own. Gina's house was actually situated in a cul-de-sac in a really upscale neighborhood just north of downtown Seattle, so... Like, oh, the door is slightly open and I hear water running. She's probably thinking somebody was just here looking at the house and accidentally, you know, missed those things. So at the time, the home that she was selling was just over a half a million dollars, but today would be closer to about a million. So when Gina made her way up the stairs to investigate where this running water was coming from, instead she found a trail of wet blood leading from a bedroom towards one of the bathrooms. She went over to this bathroom and found that both of the faucets in the vanity sink were on, as well as the shower faucet. Then, she saw a man lying face down in the bathtub, covered in blood, and appearing to have no signs of life. There was no weapon that she could see that had been left behind. The man was named Mike Immert, a popular and successful real estate agent who had several listings for properties worth over a million dollars. Gina actually didn't know Mike herself. She had listed her house with a totally different agency, but Mike was just the one that was supposed to be showing the house to his client, someone named Stephen. When police arrived, they looked around and determined that Mike had been attacked and killed in the bedroom and then dragged 18 feet down the hallway and into the bathroom where he was lifted into the tub. It was theorized that the killer turned on the water faucets to wash away trace evidence, as well as to clean himself and the murder weapon off. Mike's vehicle, a 2000 black Cadillac Escalade, was missing, and neighbors said they actually saw someone driving it away earlier that day. It was also noted that Mike's wallet, watch, and diamond ring, both worth thousands of dollars, were missing as well. As soon as police learned that Mike was showing the house to a guy named Stephen, it was theorized that he was the killer. Mike was born Michael Angelo Emmert on November 13, 1960, in Walla Walla, Washington. I still think that's the best name for a town of all time. It's my favorite. It's just fun. (laughs) So he was raised there, and he graduated from Walla Walla High School in 1979. From there, he attended Washington State University and later became involved in a seed business. In the late 80s, Mike moved to the Seattle area, and in 1990, he became a realtor. He worked in the Bellevue office of Windermere Real Estate. It was through working at this company that Mike met the woman he called his soulmate, Mary Beth. Mary Beth was a single mom with a five-year-old little girl. She and Mike became fast friends who constantly talked on the phone when they weren't together because they really just enjoyed each other's company that much. Mary Beth's daughter was also very fond of Mike and they had a close relationship. Mike even went on to coach her basketball team for two years and he often took her to Sonics games. In August of 1996, Mike and Mary Beth got married. Her parents were huge fans of Mike. In fact, Mary Beth's father said, quote, Mike was my favorite buddy. He was one of those son-in-laws that doesn't come along too often. He was a good man, end quote. Mike was also described by others as being friendly and well-respected. Those who worked with him professionally said that he had always went out of his way to help his client and said that his energy, sense of humor, and integrity just made him such an amazing person. 
On the morning of his murder, Mike told his wife, Mary Beth, that he was going to show a house to this man from California named Stephen, who was looking to relocate to Seattle. Mike described this man as being, quote, a weird dude in his 50s who used a cane and walked with a limp. Mike also said that this man had an East Coast accent, which I wish I knew exactly what he meant by that, because like East Coast Boston is different than East Coast Cocoa Beach, Florida. So like that could be, what does an East Coast accent sound like? I always thought East Coast was like Boston and stuff. I, I feel like people forget about things like Florida when they <laughs> make those wide ranges. So they think like of New England, like that area. Maybe. Yeah, like the Northeast. Okay, so Northeast maybe is possibly. We don't know though. Yeah, we don't know. But then again, East Coast, like West Virginia has a different accent as well. So, you know, like we have lots of accents on this side of the country. <laughs> They don't mean West Virginia. (laughs) (laughs) So Mike told Mary Beth that he was going to meet this man, Stephen, at a local mall at 1130, and he was going to pick him up and drive him to Gina's house again. He actually had already taken Stephen to see this house the day before, and Stephen had called and requested to view it once again on the 4th. Mary Beth later said that she found it kind of strange that Stephen even wanted to meet at the mall. Usually clients, uh, they wanted to meet at the office or at the property that they were going to see. So she said that to her it was a real red flag, but Mike probably didn't think much of it. At this time, most realtors assumed that crimes would only be committed against female realtors, not male realtors. So they kind of you know, they're thinking, what's going to happen to this, you know, this big guy, Mike? Like, he's totally fine. So also, murders that were in the area that this home were located was a super rare occurrence. There actually hadn't been one there for many, many years. So Mike did go to the mall and met up with Stephen, and they drove to the house together. We don't know exactly what time they got there, but we do know that by the time Gina got home for lunch around 1230... Stephen was gone, probably in Mike's SUV, which was later found abandoned at a nearby shopping center. And the following day, January 5th, Mike's wallet was found at the state ferry terminal and his debit card was missing. They also found Mike's phone on the same day and they later determined that the phone had been used hours after Mike was killed. Based on where they found Mike's car and wallet, it was believed that the killer drove his Escalade away from the house, dropped it off at the shopping center, and then took a bus to Seattle or possibly had a second car or driver waiting for him at the shopping center. Investigators searched Gina's home, the place where Mike was killed, as well as his SUV. There was no DNA evidence found inside the house, making it clear that the killer had taken steps to be very careful. However, they weren't so careful with the SUV. Investigators actually found blood inside of it that was later determined to belong to the killer. They also found the killer's skin under Mike's fingernails, which could be how they knew it was the same person's DNA. The DNA collected was run through the national database, but unfortunately, it didn't bring up any matches. The lack of evidence left behind, and really the bizarre circumstances, made investigators think the murder had been meticulously planned and carried out. Even though Mike's expensive personal effects were taken, Officers still believe that robbery was not the primary motive. They believe that Mike had been targeted. Police thought the killer picked the house because it was isolated from other homes. He met with Mike to view the home the day before the murder so he could get a layout of the place. Because of the way the killer turned on the faucets in order to wash away evidence, police believed Mike's murder was probably not this guy Stevens first, and it definitely wasn't his first violent assault. Police actually believed that Stephen was a hitman. But you got to ask yourself why. On January 6th, police said they still couldn't figure out a motive and they were left scratching their heads. Multiple relatives were interviewed, including, of course, his wife, Mary Beth, to see if any of them could have hired a hitman and all of them were ruled out as suspects. Other realtors in the area that could have been rivals with Mike were also looked into, but they found nothing to suggest that anyone he worked with wanted him dead. There were hundreds of people interviewed in this case, and none of them could give police a reason why Mike would be killed. On January 6th, the police said that they had a person of interest in the case. They were looking for a man they believed was named Stephen. They gave his description and said that he was from California, but they didn't have a motive. 
On January 11th, police reported that they found someone matching the description of Stephen, but that person was actually later determined to not be the killer, so we're not going to go too far into anything else about that. But the man was actually given a polygraph, and he submitted blood and hair samples, and that's how they ruled him out. On January 28th, a $50,000 reward was available for information, but still the case went unsolved, and at this point, the reporting began to slow down. At some time before the one-year anniversary of Mike's murder, Unsolved Mysteries filmed a special on his story. The police were interviewed for the show, and they said they still believe that Stephen was a hitman and that he killed Mike in this planned attack. Although Mike's wife had mentioned that Stephen walked with a limp, the police said they now believe that that may have been just a ruse and that he was faking it. And that was because they theorized that it would have been very hard for an old man with a limp to overpower someone like Mike, who was nearly six feet tall and about 190 pounds. They also pointed out that the killer had to be physically fit enough to drag Mike's body to the bathroom and lift him into the tub. It was thought that Stephen's cane was possibly just a disguised murder weapon that had a sword or a knife-like portion on the end, and they believed that Mike was possibly struck with the cane and then stabbed repeatedly. But despite the coverage on Unsolved Mysteries, Mike's case continued to go unsolved. His death left a lasting impression on the local community in Washington. Up until that point, the perception, as we said, was that agents who were women were more vulnerable to these types of attacks. But Mike's murder made his company realize that they actually needed to increase safety precautions across the board for realtors of any gender. Multiple agents came together and created the Washington State Real Estate Safety Council, which was dedicated to minimizing the risks to real estate agents and their clients. Furthermore, the state governor proclaimed that a specific week in September would be Real Estate Safety Awareness Week. So there were new rules put in place for agencies in the area, such as a new policy that new clients had to meet with agents in the office, and before a house showing, the client had to provide their ID and their license plate number. Agents were encouraged to program 911 into their phones and to create these pre-written distress signals with coworkers. Like, for example, they could send a text that said something normal, like, I need the red files, and that would be a code for I'm in danger. And we have so much more to get into with this story after a quick break to hear a word from this week's sponsors. So before the break, we were discussing the murder of Mike Emmert, the real estate agent who was killed at a showing by a man who police believe is named Stephen, who was probably from California, and that's really about all they have at this point. So when the two-year anniversary came around, Mike's wife, Mary Beth, told the Seattle Times that she was still very much in mourning and that she would visit Mike's grave on the fourth of every month and on important dates and holidays. Mary Beth said, quote, I've been putting his murder and his death in two separate places, because if I dwelt on the fact he was murdered, I'm pretty sure I'd never get out of bed, end quote. But, of course, because there hasn't been an arrest, she hadn't really been able to move on. Mary Beth said, quote, It's just like being blown up from the inside out. I do feel not having that closure is definitely standing in the way of me saying my final goodbye to Mike, end quote. Investigators said they were still tracking leads at that time and that Mike's case wasn't cold, but still another year passed. On the three-year anniversary, Mary Beth spoke to the Seattle Times again and said that she was still visiting Mike's grave often and she would never lose hope that his killer would be brought to justice. Mary Beth still made an effort to gain exposure for Mike's case, including an appearance on The Montel Williams Show. She also urged fellow real estate agents to share the story and to practice safety precautions. At this point, any tips police had gotten had been followed up on and none of them led anywhere, so they asked for the public's help. They said they still didn't even know exactly who Mike had met up with or if the person he met up with really was named Stephen or how accurate the description they even had of him was. Unfortunately, no new leads were discovered and reports slowed down even more as time passed. Then, in July of 2010, seemingly out of nowhere, the FBI inadvertently solved the case. Just like that. A DNA sample from a man named Gary Kruger had been entered into the database on an unrelated felony conviction, and that's when a match was found to the DNA in Mike's case. Gary's DNA was also linked to three other unsolved murders as well. Those victims were Mario Vassarino, Jim Barry, and Terry Dolan. He was also linked to the disappearance of a woman named Cheryl Gross. Shockingly, Gary wasn't exactly who you might expect. 
He was actually a former Seattle police officer. And if you look up his photo, you will see that he actually looks quite scary in like uh, the hills have eyes kind of way. Yeah. And so we actually do have quite a bit of info on Gary. And we want to really give a shout out where, you know, give credit where credit is due to Natalie St. John, who wrote an article for the Chinook Observer. And that's where almost all the information about Gary specifically comes from. So we just want to make sure that um, she gets the credit for her work. So Gary was a Seattle native. He was born, raised, and graduated from high school there in 1967. Gary spent the next couple of years in the Marine Corps after being talked into enlisting by his brother-in-law. So in turn, Gary also convinced seven of his own friends to enlist with them. In November of 1967, Gary, his brother-in-law, and his seven friends all went off to Vietnam. And within a year, Gary was part of an elite team of Marines and Navy corpsmen called the Combined Action Group. So this group lived in these distant villages, and they participated in psychological operations and humanitarian work. Like many who served in Vietnam, Gary saw really just absolutely horrific acts committed against Vietnamese villagers at the hands of Americans, as well as witnessed the deaths of several of his close friends, including six of the seven men that he convinced to enlist with him. His brother-in-law also died. When Gary returned to the U.S. in December of 1968, those who knew him said that he was a changed man, and not in a good way. About a year later, in January of 1969, he was discharged. About six months later, he was a Seattle police officer. Over the next four years, Gary got married and began a family. Uh, he actually had a daughter, and he decided to join the Army Reserves. So during Gary's time as a police officer, he had a few negative incidents. And by negative, I mean like really, really bad incidents. And when I read this list, I could not believe the guy was an officer for more than five minutes. In April of 1970, he used a wrestling move to subdue a fellow veteran that was being violent and uncontrollable. According to Gary, the man was posing a threat to hospital staff. But things took a big turn when the man actually died because of this restraint that Gary used on him. The hospital director went on to praise Gary for his actions, and his superiors really swept this incident under the rug. A psychologist that saw Gary later said that this experience really haunted him. In 1974, Gary and his partner severely beat a man in a parking garage, and the Seattle Police Department ended up paying the victim a measly $3,000. Then, in 1977, Gary was involved in another incident when he was sitting in his patrol car, and a prowling suspect came up to the driver's side window with a large kitchen knife in hand. Gary shot the suspect four times and killed him. His actions were deemed justifiable, but his health, career, and marriage began to crumble afterwards. At some point, he developed a gambling addiction that made him desperate for money and eventually led to his divorce. In 1979, Gary was once again involved in an on-duty altercation where a person who was high on PCP tried to get Gary's gun and shoot him with it. Gary responded by brutally beating the man and only stopped when other officers arrived at the scene. After this incident, Gary was taken off active duty and sent to a psychologist to be evaluated. The psychologist determined that Gary was in fact a liability and that he was becoming more and more unable to control his temper. Gary was a risk for continued use of excessive force. Gary was advised by his friends and the Seattle Officers Guild to quit his job as an officer. The president of the guild said if Gary didn't resign, they would ensure Gary's removal from active duty himself. So basically, leave on your own free will or we're going to remove you from this. In early 1980, Gary did leave the police force as well as the Army Reserves. At this point, Gary and his ex-wife had gotten back together and he promised he would quit the gambling, but he wasn't able to make good on this promise. He also tried to start a new career in real estate, but that was also a flop. In February of 1981, Gary became a suspect in the murder of a retired Seattle police officer named Terry Dolan. In his retirement, Terry had opened up a gas station in Everett, and on February 2nd, 1981, that gas station was robbed, and Terry was shot to death. Terry had been counting money from the register when a man came in and shot him. Neighbors reported hearing a loud bang and then squealing tires and said they saw a metallic, bluish-green colored car driving away at about 90 miles an hour. The police immediately suspected Gary because the two men were friends when they worked for the Seattle Police Department together years earlier. 
But despite being a suspect, Gary was never arrested and the case went cold. Meanwhile, Gary continued his descent into financial ruin. By 1982, he couldn't find a job and he had to file for bankruptcy. His personality also continued to change for the worse. He gambled compulsively and talked about physically harming anyone that put himself or his family in jeopardy. Then in February of 1984, a real estate attorney named Jim Barry was murdered after going to an unusually late appointment at his office. When Jim didn't come home, his wife went looking for him and found his body at about 3 a.m. He had been shot five times and stabbed 11 times. Jim's office had been ransacked, but only his wallet, watch, and jewelry were missing. So the police thought that robbery was just a, a trick and that Jim was actually the target of a planned murder. As an attorney that worked mostly on real estate and fraudulent bankruptcy cases, Jim was privy to harmful information about people, and he had confided in some of his friends that he knew something really bad about an important person. Investigators thought that it was possible that this influential person may have hired someone to kill Jim because of this. Evidence did suggest that there were two people involved in Jim's death, but the case remained unsolved until 2010 when Gary was actually one of the men linked to it. Police say the motive for Jim's murder was revenge. They told KIRO7, quote, The motivation in this case appears to be revenge. We know that Jim worked for Rainier Bank at the time. There was correspondence between the bank and Gary that he had some outstanding loans that he needed to pay. There was some direct correspondence from Jim's office to Gary's home that he needed to pay those bills, and that was the motive. By the summer of that same year, Gary and his longtime friend and crime buddy Carl Keller were both going through the worst of financial times, so Gary came up with the bright idea to rob a bank. Carl agreed to rob just one bank, but it ended up turning into a cycle where they would rob a bank and Gary would just gamble away the money and bully Carl into another holdup. The two of them hit a bank near Aberdeen in June of 1984 and tried to rob a Grayland bank on October 1st, but the bank was closed when they got there, so they couldn't go through with it, which, okay, I think that'd be a great time to rob a bank. But nobody take that <laughs> and run with it, please. <laughs> Three days later, Gary was using stolen credit cards at the mall in Linwood when he got caught. He gave the arresting officers a fake name that he had once used himself as an undercover officer and later said he lied about his name because he didn't want it to be mentioned in the news. He said the cards weren't stolen, but that he had gotten them from a friend he gambled with who borrowed $1,500 from him during a trip to Vegas. The friend couldn't pay Gary back with cash, I guess, and so he gave him the credit card to go shopping with. Police do not believe this at all, and he's charged with using stolen credit cards. Gary applied for a program for first-time offenders and used three people as his character witnesses. An old army friend whose boss Gary later murdered, his friend Carl Keller, and Tom Gross, who was the husband of Cheryl Gross who went missing in 1991. Gary's caseworker said the shopping spree was an isolated incident and that he was unlikely to be involved in any other criminal activity. He was given a suspended sentence in probation and released before the end of the month. Not long after getting out of jail, Gary and Carl robbed a bank in Island County on October 26th. Six days later, they committed another robbery in a cell. This time, police sent out a description of the robbers and began searching for them. Eventually, the FBI got involved because of the similarities between these robberies and other recent robberies, which they would later learn were committed by Gary and Carl as well. But at this time, the men remained on the run and continued robbing banks. And we somehow still have more to get into after one last break to hear word from this week's sponsors. So before the break, we have talked kind of about a lot. The story originally started with the murder of realtor Mike Emmert, who was killed while he was showing a home in a town near Seattle, Washington. And the case went cold for many years until it was later solved by the FBI after they matched the DNA from a man named Gary Kruger to Mike Emmert's murder, along with many, many other crimes. However, at this point, they still did not know where he was. So we're kind of getting into a little bit of the story about what Gary was up to in the meantime while he was out on the run before the FBI was able to match him to Mike's death. So in October of 1985, Mario Vassarino, one of the victims that was later tied to Gary, was killed inside of his home. His badly beaten body was found in the bathtub with the water running. 
In this particular case, there was Parmesan cheese sprinkled over the victim. And according to the police, Parmesan cheese at a murder scene like this was like a calling for a mob hit or a rat, which, Melissa, have you ever heard of that? I've never heard of that. I feel like that's something I would have heard of. No, but why are we wasting cheese? I just don't I don't understand the connection either. But the house looked like it had been ransacked. And the police believe, though, again, that this was just kind of to throw them off. They felt like it looked, though, it had been staged. Mario's car was stolen and found abandoned several miles away, and his wallet was later found at a local strip club. There were a few motives that were considered in Mario's death, including rumors that he'd been cooperating with a federal organized crime investigation. There was a commission in Chicago that was looking into some allegations of racketeering, kickbacks, tax evasion, and embezzlement of union funds. Mario's case ultimately, though, wasn't solved once again until 2010 when the DNA from Mike Emmert's murder was matched to Gary. When detectives started looking into Gary Moore, they found out that one of his army buddies, who we'll call Stan, was actually a longtime person of interest in Mario's murder, even back in the very beginning. While tracking down and talking to witnesses, they spoke to someone who said that Gary had actually confessed. Gary allegedly said that Mario was Stan's boss, and Stan was worried that Mario was going to fire him, which meant that Stan would lose his union benefits. So Gary killed Mario and Stan remained with the union and eventually even became the president of the union. What? Yes. Yeah. So, of course, the police believe that Gary actually killed Mario as a favor to his friend Stan and that this was not, in fact, a mob hit. But I guess maybe Gary was trying to throw them off with that, too, like he had at every other murder scene that they found. Like there was some they thought something had been staged. Maybe he knew about the Parmesan cheese and was like, right. oh, if I do that they'll think it was a mob hit so when the police interviewed gary's own wife and asked her if he had killed mario her response was quote of course he did end quote gary and carl continued their robbing spree their last robbery of 1986 was on october 21st and in this case each of them fled the bank separately as Gary was making his getaway, a Grays Harbor County deputy passed by and thought Gary just looked suspicious. So he ran the plates on the car and he found out that the car he was in was actually stolen. From there, a very, very dangerous car chase ensued with speeds reaching 100 miles an hour until Gary eventually lost control of his vehicle and crashed. He was unconscious and bleeding when the deputy walked up to the car and the officer ended up calling for an ambulance for him. Gary was rushed to the hospital with a badly broken leg, fractured ribs, and head and chest injuries, but he was alive, and he would go on to make a full recovery. When police looked inside Gary's car, they found two duffel bags containing two rubber masks, a police scanner, ski caps, a blue revolver, and a small handgun. Deputies called on other departments to see if there were any robbery involving men wearing old man masks. Multiple counties confirmed having similar robberies. The FBI then set up a meeting with the local departments and said they had noticed a multitude of similarities between six different robberies between 1984 and 1986. Among these similarities was the fact that the suspects always drove off in a 66B or 67 Plymouth and that the leader carried a police radio and a blue revolver and always demanded big money and traveler's checks. They said they knew that one of the robbers was Gary. A warrant to search Gary's house was obtained, and police found a briefcase full of stolen checks there. They continued to hunt for Gary's accomplice. In November, Gary's friend Carl turned himself in. He confessed to eight robberies he committed with Gary. In the end, the two both took plea deals. Gary was given 15 years, but he only served seven of them before being released in 1992. His wife and daughter stood by him through it all. It wasn't until nine years later in January of 2001 that Mike Emmert was murdered and police struggled to track down his killer. Meanwhile, in February of 2001, Gary robbed another bank and then went back to the same bank two months later, but this time he got caught while trying to flee. He took a plea deal again and was given 70 months for the robbery and as a condition of his plea deal, he was ordered to submit a DNA sample upon his release. Mandy, you have a note here. Why don't they make you... If they're going to make you submit your DNA, why don't they do that when you first get there? Why are they like, hey, when you leave, do me a favor, close the door behind you and give us your DNA? Yeah, that part was probably one of the most shocking things I've heard because that doesn't make any sense. While you have the person right there in front of you, it takes two seconds to swab the inside of their cheek and collect a DNA sample. 
instead of trusting that the criminal is going to go submit their own DNA once they're released, like that doesn't not make a lot of sense to me. And it didn't in this case either because Gary was released in 2004 and put on probation. But like Mandy was saying, he didn't end up submitting his DNA. A few years later, Gary's probation officer lobbied for Gary to be released from supervision early and stated that Gary was not a danger to the community. Gary finally gave his DNA sample in 2007, but due to a backlog of over 300,000 samples, it wasn't entered into the national system until July 2010. So that's three more years. On the night of March 26, 2010, Gary, who was now 62 years old, and an accomplice, a 64-year-old man named John Bradshaw, ambushed a man and his college-age son as they arrived home around 10.30 that night. The man, Corey, was an orthopedic surgeon who lived with his wife and kids in a lakefront home on Lake Washington. Corey and his wife, Shelby, did not know Gary or John. Corey and his son were coming home from the airport when either John or Gary popped out and threatened them with a gun. Corey's wife and daughter were still inside the house, totally unaware of what was happening outside. Corey lunged at his attacker and started punching him, but he was then zapped with a stun gun several times and pistol whipped from behind. By this point, Gary and John were now working as a team to subdue both of the men. One of them then went to the front door and tried to kick it down. Shelby, who, as we said, was inside, heard all the commotion and actually came to the front door and opened it, not realizing that there was a threat outside. She saw a man dressed in all black and he was yelling at her, so she slammed the door shut and locked the deadbolt while she called 911. The gunman then went back to where Corey and the other gunman were and tried to talk Corey into letting them inside the house, but Corey refused. So either Gary or John then pointed a gun at Corey. We're saying either or because, as we said, they were wearing masks, so no, we don't know who kind of was responsible right. for each specific event in this per, you know, particular um, altercation. So before long, though, Gary and John realized that the police were going to be showing up soon. So they kind of gave up and they demanded that Corey hand over his car keys so they could flee in his car. But Corey refused because he knows, you know, hey, my house key is attached to this key ring and he didn't want to give these criminals any access to his home. Gary and John decided to just have Corey lay on the ground while they fled. And at the time, nobody knew this, but the two of them went and stole a neighbor's boat and went out onto Lake Washington. The two of them were never seen again alive. Mandy, is there a movie made about this case? Because I feel like they need to have a movie based on this case. Is there a movie? I don't know. I feel like there should be. Absolutely should be a movie. I wouldn't be surprised if there is one. Right. Once Gary and John were gone, Corey ran inside his house and Shelby told him she had already called the police and that they were in the neighborhood. Canine teams and a helicopter with heat-seeking ability were deployed to search for the two gunmen, but they weren't able to find them. At this point, they of course did not know the assailants were Gary and John. One of the two's masks had actually been torn off their head during this attack and that was sent in for testing. Police believed that Corey and Shelby were targeted, but they weren't sure why. About a week later, Gary's wife filed a missing persons report on Gary, and she described him as being broke and desperate for money. She said the last time she saw Gary, he was on his way to Bremerton in a van. Investigators found that van abandoned in a strip mall parking lot about a mile from Corey's house, but they couldn't find Gary or John anywhere. In July, the DNA that was taken from the mask was actually matched to John. He had spent time in federal prison for arson and money laundering and didn't seem to be the typical home invasion burglar. Police found out that Gary must have been the accomplice in Corey's home invasion, but they still didn't know why they did it for quite a while. It was later determined that Gary's motive to attack Corey was likely because Corey, who, as we said before, was an orthopedic surgeon, had refused to perform a knee replacement on Gary's wife, which is terrifying if you're a doctor and they have the reasons why they're not going to do it. It could be like another health reason. There's all kinds of reasons that they, they legitimate reasons why they wouldn't do it. Right. And to know that you could do that and somebody could want to kill you is just wild. So although they were pretty sure that Gary and John were the men they were looking for, they still didn't know where they were. Later in July, the FBI finally got around to pulling Gary's DNA into the national database and immediately he was matched to multiple unsolved murders. Police looked for Gary even more, but it would still be a few months before they found him, floating dead in Lake Washington. Police searched the lake, but they couldn't find John's body. 
they did find the stolen nine-foot aluminum boat the men took off in. It was partially submerged in the lake near Gary's body. Inside the boat, authorities found a duffel bag with duct tape, zip ties, and extra ammo. Based on these new findings, police theorized that Gary and John attacked Corey, stole his neighbor's boat, and tried to make it across the lake. But something went wrong, and that boat sank. Although both men likely could swim, it would be pretty hard to swim across a massive lake in March in the middle of the night. Police believe that John did drown alongside Gary, even though his body never resurfaced. So Corey and his family, though, were understandably paranoid that John's body was never found because they had no idea whether he was alive or dead or if he was going to come back and finish the job at any time. The neighbor whose boat was stolen apparently told Corey that he only saw one set of footprints on his property, which only led to further anxiety that John had actually escaped and was still out there somewhere. Corey was so fearful of this that he actually used his own money to hire sonar body recovery specialists to try and find John's body in Lake Washington, but they didn't find him. I can't even imagine the cost of something like that. The level of fear they must have had to actually go to that that level, you know, to hire like somebody to come and search the lake with sonar technology. They were definitely scared that he was, you know, they wanted confirmation that he was not going to be coming back to hurt them. Understandably. For sure. To this day, though, John's body has never been found. If he were to be alive, he would be 77 years old today. Investigators made several announcements over the next couple of years following Gary's death and being linked to multiple murders. It was officially announced that he was suspected in the killing of Terry Dolan, who we mentioned earlier, and that he was the killer of Jim Barry and Mario Vassarino. But Mario's case was actually still being looked into to see if Gary had acted alone or if he had an accomplice in that case. Gary was Mike's murderer, but the case wasn't closed because the police were still investigating whether or not another person may have actually hired Gary to kill Mike or if another person was somehow also involved in Mike's murder. To this day, police don't know what Mike and Gary's connection is or why Gary killed Mike Emmert. The only connection they can really find is that they both worked in real estate, but that's a very loose connection considering that Gary was like barely even in real estate and he was done with it by 1982 Yeah, and Mike didn't become a real estate agent until even 1990. So they really didn't have a big overlap with that. So Mike's wife, Mary Beth, told KIRO-TV that she didn't know who Gary was and she also said that she'd almost given up hope that Mike's killer would ever be caught. She said, quote, it was agonizing waking up every morning and not knowing why this happened to Mike. What happened to Mike? Who did this? Because Gary was dead by the time he was linked to all these unsolved crimes, the families of his victims won't be able to see justice in the courtroom. Mary Beth said that it made her blood boil, that DNA testing backlog kept Gary out on the streets for longer than necessary. That has to be... One of the most gut-wrenching feelings once they match his DNA years later to multiple unsolved crimes, like to the victim's families to think like if they had been able to put this DNA sample in and catch him faster, you know, my loved one may have, you know, still be alive. Like that's just, I can see how that would be absolutely infuriating to kind of find that out. So she did say that she's glad to know who exactly what it was that killed her husband, Mike, but she feels like she was still denied a chance to see justice. Mary Beth said, quote, I'm good with the fact that Kruger is dead because there's no reason why somebody that awful should be walking around society. So good, he's dead. And I know he didn't pass through the pearly gates with Mike standing there. He's in the bowels of hell and that's where he belongs. As far as we can tell, there haven't been any updates in any of these cases since 2012, though. Um, But, you know, as we know, it kind of things do move slow and cases will hopefully be closed officially as they kind of work through all the figuring out if you know there was any accomplices and everything it's so wild to me that they do know who killed mike but they really just don't know why because it does seem like everything that gary was doing he was maybe being paid or doing a favor or something like that like there was some connection it doesn't seem like he just had a reason to go and kill um, Mike so then you have to wonder like they're doing who who would have been behind this who and, and they couldn't figure that out to begin with they had nobody that really seemed to be an enemy of him so it's really sad for their family too because then you also have to be thinking could somebody be coming after me yeah 
you don't know. You don't know why somebody was going after Mike. I don't know. This is one of the weirder stories that we've talked about just because there's so much going on with Gary and he just kind of jumps from thing to thing and it doesn't really seem to be super cohesive except he just doesn't really care and he's not going to stop until he literally yeah. dies after yeah. trying this. And it, this is another one of those cases where every once in a while we get one where somebody has committed multiple crimes violent crimes even like very terrible things and they've gone to jail they've been sentenced for things but they keep being released after only spending like 11 months or 12 months in in jail and then they get back out and do the same crime and they only spend a little bit of time behind bars again and it's kind of like it's crazy to me that some people can do that and then other people don't you know other people will, will just land in jail and stay there and won't get out but then others keep being able to like right. repeat their same yeah. offenses over and over so yeah it's definitely an interesting and fascinating case for sure really really sad that it took that long to finally get his Absolutely. dna in the database and match him to um his crimes yeah all right melissa that was our story for this week are you ready to turn the page and move on to last thing before we go i do i am I do. I'm not marrying you. <laughs> um, um, yes, Mandy, this week we talked about a realtor in real estate. So I just looked up some facts about real estate that I wasn't aware of. And I'll be interested to know if you are aware of it. One of the things that is actually kind of, how do you feel about the metaverse? Do you understand the metaverse? Do you get it? Well, do Are I you understand it and how do I feel about it are two different questions. <laughs> <laughs> let's go both. Do you understand? Wait, let's go with how do you feel about it and then do you understand I it? I don't know if I feel great about it just because, you know, like I don't like, I don't know. I like to keep my things separate. I don't like to keep, I don't like the idea of just like one company having like total control over like a lot of different oh, yeah. things a that monopoly? I'm like involved mm -hmm. in. Like that just feels weird, right? Like it kind of reminds me of um, my husband was telling me about like big companies and like Disney looks at, is looking at doing this where they like will build like housing like areas but only for their employees and I'm like wait a minute so like your boss is also your landlord like that just seems like a little too a little bit too it much like it could go yeah really wrong. so uh, yeah. But I kind of feel like that about like the metaverse like I don't want like everything I do online to be connected like to be controlled and connected to the same one entity like that just feels but you know I'm like a big conspiracy theorist like that anyway so it's not yeah, really my I thing know. that was <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I'm not even going to ask if you know what it is because I still don't really know what it is. Um, but I know it's like virtual reality and stuff and like you have your own world. You can buy real estate in the metaverse. Oh, okay. Are you cool no. with that? Are like, you going to? I just don't, I guess I don't understand it then to answer the second question. <laughs> <laughs> My son at night sometimes, like if I'm laying in there with him trying to help him get to sleep or whatever, he'll randomly say the most scary things. And my favorite scary thing that he says to me just unprompted is are we living in a simulation and i'm like i don't know but it's too late to think about this <laughs> but i guess the metaverse is but you can literally the virtual real estate world in metaverse there's like real real estate agents that are actually making money there's only a certain amount of property sales are exceeding 1.4 billion dollars in 2022 real so money there's real dollars mandy <laughs> real dollars so again back to that one you don't understand it i don't understand it that is really what we know about this here's one that i found really interesting okay do you know where housewarmings come from like if you're doing a housewarming well i know i mean i don't know where they originated no oh sorry where did they originate you know what it i know is. what it is yes but, but i don't know okay. what started it kind of interesting so in the early days of mortgage the interest rates are high like 15 to 20 percent way back in the day right and so there's often these balloon payments similar to today's like down payments that we have so when a mortgage is paid off and the homeowners you know are done paying for it they would actually burn their mortgage documents and that was known as a housewarming and guests would come over and bring gifts and stuff and they're being free and clear and that would be a housewarming that's kind of cool i kind of like that like that's it, it makes sense too. unlike some of these things that we have and they're like oh this is how it started and you're like that doesn't even make sense well that one actually makes sense i love that one too because like we are so um 
uh, we want to reward early. So we've like all changed it. And they're like, congratulations, you owe for this house for 30 years. Let me buy you a gift. And back then it was like, you paid it off. Congratulations. Okay, Mandy, do you know a gift that is considered um, bad luck to give somebody uh, for a housewarming gift? I don't. I'm not very superstitious. I just learned recently that it's bad luck to bring a banana on a boat. So (laughs) I don't know. There's all kinds of weird like superstitions. It just sounds like it would be gross. It'd be like warm because you can't really put it in a cooler, That's probably the real reason why is because it's just not really a good food for like being out in the sun. (laughs) That actually hurt my stomach. I don't want to think about that. (laughs) That should be bad luck. So here's this story. I've never heard of this, but it's kind of interesting. So superstition, like you were saying, you're not superstitious, but superstition says if you give a knife as a gift, you risk severing your friendship with that person. Oh, a knife? That's crazy. I would think that would be a totally acceptable housewarming gift. But you can do it, Mandy. Here's what you have to do, though. You have to take a penny and give it to them, like you tape it to the blade. Um, And that's like basically saying that they can take the penny and pay you for this knife. So like you, I give you a knife with a penny tape to it. You give me the penny back. You're paying for the knife. So it's not technically a gift. So then it's not bad luck. This website okay. I'm on just might really have right. some questionable things. I don't I know. can't wait until I have somebody move into it. I'm like, I can't wait to give someone a knife with a penny tape to it and watch them be like, what is this? <laughs> I mean, I don't know that I would do that. It, it sounds a little creepy. <laughs> and then be like, give me your penny. Give, give me your penny. <laughs> now you have to give me the penny back. <laughs> exactly. Mandy, do you know why barns are typically the color red? I feel like this is something I should know. Think about like back in the day when this all started. What would be a reason you would paint something a certain color? What? Well, I mean, that's like literally the question. So that you can see it, obviously, right? A little. Yes, that is obviously. But it's actually because it was very cheap to make red paint. So they would use what they would have on hand, like lime, milk, and red iron oxide, which is rust. Mix it together. And then that turns into a nice red paint so that's why a lot our barns are still painted red to this day wow yeah and it's like a specific color you call it like a barn red is like not, yeah it's not the same which as is basically rust right re- regular mm-hmm. red. yeah yeah <laughs> that's all i have awesome those were very fun good all right guys well that was the episode for this week thank you guys for listening we will be back next week same time same place new story have a great week bye